Investment Committee for January 4th is called to order uh, welcome members to the 2023-24 uh, Capital Investment Committee. Really excited to have all of you here with us today. And just wanted to uh, let you know that we have been assigned room 120 so that we could allow for remote uh, participation from testifiers from across the entire state so that they don't have to drive down here on days like this if they don't uh, need to. And then I um, just really want to say I'm hopeful that we can all work together this year to you know, get something done this session. And also, I'm really looking forward to traveling with all of you as we uh, tour the entire state of Minnesota in the fall and uh, get ourselves ready for next year. So with that, uh, today, why don't we start with uh, introductions from our committee members. And if you could just tell us a little bit about your district, uh, district number, and if you have served on Capital Investment Committee before, and also if we were to tour or visit your uh, district, what is one place, landmark, et cetera, that you would recommend us uh, seeing? So Representative Fu Lee from District 59A, which is North Minneapolis, uh, serving my third term on Capital Investment Committee, uh, second time as chair. And then in my uh, community, we have the first naturally filtering pool in the country. Uh, it's part of Minneapolis Park and Rec Board. I believe we drove through it. Uh, I think there's an echo, so if you have a phone by your mic, please uh, just move it away so that there's no more echo. With that, we'll turn it over to uh, Vice Chair Ryer. Hello, everyone. I'm Vice Chair Liz Ryer. I represent Egan and Burnsville, and I'm in my second term on capital investment, first term as Vice Chair. Um, if you were to come to Egan and Burnsville and go down to the Minnesota River, uh, you would find a, a beautiful and extensive set of trails where you can walk, you can bike, you can see all kinds of wildlife, and it's just a lovely oasis right in the middle of our heavily developed suburb. All right, thank you. Next up will be uh, Rep Republican lead, Representative Erdahl. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm Representative Dean Erdahl. I represent... Uh, Meeker County, Renville County, well, half of Meeker, all of Renville, all of Chippewa, the uh, southeastern corner of Candioi County. Uh, this is my 10th term on capital investment, uh, my 11th term here. So 20 of my 22 years I've been on capital investment committee. Uh, I left it one time because I was here my first term and we didn't do anything. Chair Krinky had a different philosophy. <laughs> and uh, then I realized after one term away that if you wanted to have an opportunity to try to do good things for your district and the people of Minnesota, uh, this is the place to be. And uh, that's why I came back and I've been here ever since. Uh, looking forward to uh, uh, working with uh, the committee members and Chair Lee and uh, accomplishing some very needed things this year. If you come to my district, there's so many things. I mean, I used to represent the biggest ball of twine made by one man, uh, but that's now in an, another district. Uh, I, I suppose uh, the, the Litchfield, we could go to the Litchfield Opera House and, uh, and see that, or the uh, milk processing plant that brings in 7.5 million pounds of milk every day into Litchfield. So, uh, Thank you, look forward to working with all of you. Thank you, Representative Erdahl, and then we'll try to go in alphabetical order. Representative Carroll. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm Ned Carroll, I represent District 42A, which is the western part of Plymouth. I share it with Judy Cleborn, she, she's the B side to my A side. I have a little bit of Maple Grove. I'm familiar with this committee, familiar with Chair Lee, because several years ago you came, the bottom chair came by, looking at uh, what used to be County Road 47, it was an old, dilapidated, uh, outdated uh, road. It was not safe. It was under capacity. And I was pleased that the committee came by. Um, I wasn't pleased that we missed out on a bonding opportunity last year, but I'm hopefully we can, we can make up for that. Um, and there's other needs, too. Uh, but uh, aside from that, I'm very pleased that we have a new community center, well, a, a remodeled community center, an expanding community center. I worked on that since I was chair of the Parks and Rec Commission in Plymouth. Followed that up when I was on the council. 
and uh, delighted to be here to help <coughs> with that. We were able to get some bonding money for that, so um, I was delighted and grateful for that. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Representative Carroll. And then members, uh, please remember to speak into the mic as you talk. Next, we got Representative Fogelman. My name is Representative Fogelman. I represent most of Nobles County, all of Jackson County, four townships in Cottonwood County, half of Watonwan County, and four townships in Martin County. I have not served on any committees. This is my first term in office. I would recommend coming to Worthington in September. It is the turkey capital of the world, and they have a big parade and turkey races, and it's a very diverse area, and it's, we get a lot of people that come from all over, so it's a fun, fun place to be on that day. Thank you, Representative Fogelman. Next up, we have Representative Franson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Franson, District 12B. Alexandria, Carlos, Nelson, Osakis, Sock Center, Melrose, Greenwald, and I think I got it all. Um, anyway, uh, excited to be here. I've never been on bonding, and this is my first time, and bonding is extremely important to our entire state, and so I'm just really blessed to be a part of the team this year. Uh, as far as uh, the district goes, so we have Sinclair Lewis out of Sock Center, who was a a American author of like the 20s. And then for all of you who know Alexandria, the Kensington Runestone. If you don't know what the Kensington Runestone is, we have a museum dedicated to it called uh, the Runestone Museum. But the inscription, uh, which is comes from MinPost, you can Google it. There's a lovely little article on the Runestone. Uh, but it is generally accepted translation, comes from the MinPost there. We are eight eight Goths or Swedes, and 22, 22 Norwegians on an ex exploration journey from Vinland through the west. We had camped by a lake with two skerries, one day's journey north from this stone. We were out and fished one day. After we came home, we found 10 of our men, red with blood and dead. Ave uh, Virgo Maria, save us from evil. We have 10 of our party by the sea to look for our ships, 14 days journey from this island, year 1362. So there's you know, is it a hoax? Is it real? We in Alexandria, of course, believe it is real. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I could just sorry, no. briefly <laughs> add to that. Um, you, there was the first confrontation there between uh, Native people and uh, Europeans, uh, Vikings. It is my contention that as a result of that, a curse was placed upon them, and Vikings will never be successful in Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Representative Erdahl. Thank you, Representative Friends. So next up, we have Representative Grasso. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, it's good to be back on bonding. I uh, took a little break from it, not by choice, but ended up getting put someplace else for a while. So it's, uh, so it's good to be back. Um, I believe uh, bonding is very important. Uh, we, need to, we need to take care of some very, uh, very important infrastructure work, and this is a place to get it done and to the citizens elected us to be good stewards of the tax dollars that they put in here. And I hope that we can all agree that uh, there, are, there are needs across the state that must be met, need to be met, and we're the ones that got to make that decision. So let's work together, do it wisely, and do it uh, to, to benefit all. Uh, I come from District 2A. It is right in the dead center of northern Minnesota, north central Minnesota, Lake of the Woods County, northwest Angle, uh, I've got Lake of the Woods up there. I've got uh, 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 Beltrami County and part of Clearwater County. Uh, that place up there, I can't say one place to go because as far as I'm concerned, it's God's country. That's where everybody else comes to vacation, and that's where I live. There are so many things for people to do up there that I, I can't number them all. It's good hunting, good fishing, good trails, everything, everything that you want to do. It's a great place to live and thrive and raise a family and enjoy. Enjoy your neighbors and enjoy uh, this, this beautiful state of ours. Thank you, Representative Grasso. And then for the members that just came in, introduction, your district. And if we're to visit, visit your district, where should we uh, tour, landmarks, places, et cetera? Next up, Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, my district has changed quite a bit uh, since last year. Uh, I had been in 52A, which was Northern Dakota County. Now I have all of South St. Paul, 
two precincts of Invergrove Heights, uh, Newport, St. Paul Park, and then that part of Cottage Grove uh, south of Highway 61, and Gray Cloud Island Township. So I have both Dakota County and Washington County. 85% of my district is new. Uh, it's first, first tier suburbs, older communities along the river, a lot of infrastructure needs. Uh, Newport has, and I think we've heard from Newport before when Representative Frankie had it, a lot of infrastructure with inflow infiltration, a lot of old pipes, a lot of dead trees uh, that we need to work on. So urban reforestation is important. Um, I think if you were touring, uh, we've toured uh, the South St. Paul Library. Uh, they were able to fund the library from uh, leftover uh, COVID aid from the federal government, uh, but there will be the replacement of the, of the old library and purposing that. And maybe we can visit uh, uh, the Hmong Slaughterhouse in South St. Paul if, if after lunch, um, we can stop in there and, and during lunch and uh, tour that, uh, which is really only about 10 minutes from the Capitol. So looking forward to serving again. Thank you, Representative Hanson. Next, uh, Representative, Representative Kalowski. Thank you, Chair Lee. Hello, everybody. My name's um, Representative Alicia Kalowski, and I represent Eastern Duluth, which is District 8B, and I feel like I hit the committee jackpot getting on the, the Capital Investment Committee. It's Obviously, as we've heard echoed here today, it is monumental for Duluth, uh, Greater Minnesota, and all, every pocket of the state. Um, and I would say if you came to Duluth, there's so much. We, as Ojibwe people, actually call Duluth a Masabe Kong, which means the center of all good things. So it has everything that we need to live a good life and um, be in good relation with each other and, and with this land. And for future generations. And so, but now I would say, you know, I know that some of the big priorities um, that we've continued to lean into uh, getting down to the lake where we have an incredible um, entertainment convention center and that is growing our, our businesses and our, our cultural um, community, as well as we've got cruisers down there. And so the sea walls are, are going to be really big for Duluth going up to, you know, the airport and all across uh, Duluth. There's so many things that. Um, we've got a really thriving healthcare system um, that we need to continue to invest in for our workforce and for health equity um, and closing some of those gaps. Uh, I would also say, likewise, bring you to my favorite restaurant in Mexico Lindo um, when you come up to Duluth, but so much um, to, to do and beyond. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative Kowalski. Next up, Representative Lilly. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, excited to be on. Uh, on the committee, uh, been lucky enough to be on here a couple terms. Thanks for calling me, Dan. Dan was, <laughs> he was just calling me right now. <laughs> so anyways, uh, um, I represent uh, some East Metro communities, uh, um, Oakdale, uh, Pine Springs, Landfall, and uh, Maplewood and North St. Paul. So we're kind of our city mascot. Uh, we don't have the ball of twine like someone over here will probably might hear about. Uh, later, We're, but uh, we have the snowman so uh, as a city mascot. So I'm sorry for this uh, snow we're getting. That's uh, I think it's my fault. Um, but anyways, uh, I'm really excited to be on this committee. And uh, one of the reasons I asked to be on it is um, things around the state I care about. Uh, you know that uh, not just my own projects, but you really get to know your the other committees members and legislators, districts, and the whole state. But uh, things that are important to me locally is uh, um, there's a Tubman Center. I'm hoping that we can add some money in. They've been good. They do domestic abuse work. And I'm hoping to add some money for them. Again, they have a, a smaller ask you know, for some elevators and some other things that can really help them out to, to continue to do their good work. Um, through the last couple of years, they've really made an effort, uh, the legislature, and. Um, through your leadership chair and the previous chairs uh, uh, to uh, improve Highway 36 going out towards Stillwater. And so they've uh, done, um, or we all have done, uh, different intersections. So I'm hoping down the road here we can add in uh, Highway 120 and 36, but we've done Hadley and Manning. So I think it would be really uh, great. I mean, it's quite a dangerous uh, intersection and there's, uh, um, 
it just makes a lot of sense to do that. So, but uh, North St. Paul, I guess uh, one of the things, we have one of the oldest bars in the state of Minnesota, Newman's. So if uh, I hope that I could get you all to come there and uh, park for a few minutes and maybe have a, a grilled cheese sandwich at the, the oldest bar in Minnesota. I know some people around here I've seen, I've heard that they go there and, uh, and that might have more expertise than I do. And, but anyways, thanks for, uh, thanks for having us. I'm excited to be on the committee and, and uh, we can do amazing work. It's just exciting times. Thank you, Representative Lilly. Next up, we have Representative Myers. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so Representative Andrew Myers, I am representing 45A, which is the western portion of Lake Minnetonka, approximately 11 cities. And you know, if you're familiar with Lake Minnetonka, of course, that's going to be the place uh, to come out to. You know, it touches a lot of different uh, cities that I represent. Um, you know, and it's important for me both from a clean water perspective, but also uh, economic perspective. So I'm looking forward to being on this committee to serve and work towards, you know, clean water, bonding, and roads. Thank you, Representative Myers. Next up, Representative Pulaski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm the only member of the Minnesota House that has had not one, but two House mini sessions in his area. The first was in September of 1989, when the entire House was in southeastern Minnesota, with Winona being the center, and the majority of those hearings dealt with infrastructure projects. The most recent was in October of 2019, October 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. And again, Winona was the center of it, but there were hearings in Rochester, there were hearings in Austin, there were hearings in Caledonia, hearings in Preston, and hearings in Rushford. And again, infrastructure was the primary goal. I would be an advocate of returning, now that the pandemic is over, to having another mini session in this interim. And if I was going to pick a spot and I see the member is nodding his head, I would say the St. Cloud area. Mr. Chair, I've served on this committee before, several times actually, and the first time I became a charter member of the Anti-Flat Roof Society, that no building should be built, it's a public building in Minnesota, with a flat roof. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Pulaski. Next up, we have uh, Representative Scraba. Thank you, Chairman. My name's Roger Scraba. I represent the people from District 3A. Um, I'll cut to the chase and I'll add later, but where would I send you? I don't know. Where do you want to go? The North Shore, the Boundary Waters? Do you want to go to Ely, International Falls, Rainy Lake, Rainy River flows into my, my uh, over towards Beltrami. Um, there's really no one place. I'm, I'm sure everyone's been there. Um, I'm excited to be on this committee. Um, I've hosted your committee in Ely. I used to be the mayor of Ely. Um, last year, I met with you folks um, at the community college. We had some projects, so I'm familiar. I'm looking forward to actually, I was, I was telling Ned that, and Dan that I, I like learning. Learning is a big deal to me. And this committee, you learn a lot, a lot about a lot. And I have a degree in construction management from North Dakota State University. And it seems, I never used it for a profession, but I seem to use it for everything but making money. So I'm hoping now I can put it to work in the wastewater and those sort of issues. And uh, I also sit on natural resources and legacy. So I'm trying to figure out how we can tie all three of these together for big projects that really uh, will help the state throughout the state. And I, and I look forward to serving with everyone. And oh, one last thing, um, at being a freshman, uh, we did a lot of door knocking this year. And one of the biggest things that we heard at the doors was do something. So I'm, I'm programmed to do something. So I'm hoping we do something in this committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Scrabble. Next up, we have Representative West. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I am Representative West. I represent Blaine, Ham Lake, and Columbus, which I love those cities, but I miss representing only one in my old district. Normally, I'd say you got to go to the National Sports Center, but that got cut out of my district, so no longer can claim that, which is very sad. But one thing I did get was running aces. One of two horse tracks in the state and also a casino. It is somewhere, if you come to my district, you should definitely go. It is freshly remodeled. They built a new hotel and business is booming. So that has been a uh, bright spot in redistricting outside of being able to return here. It's my second term on uh, bonding, which is by far my favorite committee. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. And I appreciate the way you run it, Mr. Chair. 
it's done better than most other committees I've ever been on. And I want to say as a minority member, it's very much appreciated. But thanks for having us. Thank you, Representative West. Next up, we have Representative Wolgamott. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Dan Wolgamott, and I am now serving in my third term representing District 14B, which includes St. Cloud and Minden Township. This will be my second term on the bonding committee, so it's good to be back here. And there are all kinds of great places to go in my district, Mr. Chair. Where to begin? Well, I guess I would want to invite you back to downtown St. Cloud, which is a, an incredible hub of dining and entertainment in residential areas. And you'll be hearing a lot more about me from that, Mr. Chair and committee members, because um, we're going to be putting forward a request to get some help to revitalize downtown St. Cloud for the benefit of all Minnesota. Uh, I would invite you to the Municipal Athletic Complex. I'd invite you back there. I know you've been there in the past and uh, this committee has supported uh, capital investments in the Municipal Athletic Complex. It's a great place to watch a baseball game, watch a hockey game, all kinds of good stuff there. Uh, otherwise, I would invite you to the quarries, which is a great uh, natural place to go and swim and enjoy a nice summer day in St. Cloud. So, um, and I also want to wholeheartedly uh, represent repre or to wholeheartedly wholeheartedly echo Representative Pulaski's sentiments that it would be wonderful to host a mini session and have you come out and and see more um, of what St. Cloud is about. Whether it's our our healthcare system, our downtown St. Cloud, our colleges, universities, um, or we also, Mr. Chair, need to do some work on wastewater treatment and and waste management facilities as well. So. A lot of work to be done in this committee, and I just want to express, Mr. Chair, how grateful I am to be on this committee, and members, I look forward to working with you to get something done, and, and we do need to get something done, not just for the future, but also to make up for the past couple of years of unfortunate inaction in passing a bill. So thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I look forward to our work together. Thank you, Representative Wolgamont. Next up, Representative Zhang. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I probably serve the southeast corner of St. Paul, capital city, home of the Pig's Eye Lake and Pig's Eye Dump Site, where Chair Lee and Chair Hansen have been working with me the last uh, biennial to help clean it up. Looking forward to working with all of y'all to uh, meet the infrastructure needs in my district. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Representative Jean. So right now we'll move over to staff, and for staff, if you could just let us know uh, how long have you been serving on Capital Investment Committee? And uh, we'll go from there. So first up, we have Ms. Chelsea Griffin. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Chelsea Griffin. I'm a legislative analyst with the House Research Department. And this is my uh, second biennium serving the Capital Investment uh, Committee. Can you also let us know if you serve on other committees, too? Thank oh, you. Oh, sorry, Mr. Chair. I uh, also serve on the, or I serve the state and a local government a policy and finance committee. Thank you, Ms. Griffin. Next up, we have Mr. Andrew Lee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Andrew Lee uh, from the nonpartisan House Fiscal Office, and this will be my 11th session on capital investment, and I also staff transportation. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Uh, next up, we have Mr. Dan Dodge. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Dan Dodge. This is my second day on capital investment <laughs> committee, and I also work for the St Sustainable Infrastructure Committee, and for the past three years, I was on transportation. Thank you, Mr. Dodge. Next up, we have Ms. Chelsea Axelson. Uh, Chelsea Axelson, I served as the CLA in 2016 under Chair Torkelson, and then last year as a researcher, and this year I am also a researcher. Thank you. Next up, we have Ms. Jen Nelson. I'm a DFL researcher for the committee. I've been with this committee the past three um, terms, and I also serve transportation and now sustainable infrastructure. Thank you, and now we have Ms. Jenny Nash. Hi, um, I'm the committee administrator. I've been with the committee, my first year was 2007, and I was with the committee for four years. Took a little break, came back to the committee for 13 and 14, took another little break, and came back in 19 and have been with the committee since then. Thank you, and then this year, uh, being back in person, we do have pages for the committee, and so first up, we have Nick Sandberg. Thank you. Then uh, next up, we have Sarah Jane. Hi, I'm Sarah Jane. I'm 
And so members, you know, just a reminder to be nice to our pages. I uh, <laughs> did remind the pages this morning that I used to serve as a page myself back in the 14th session. And then Miss Nash started out at the house as a page too. And so we never know if they'll be serving next to us or uh, for the committee. So really appreciate all of the introduction members. Uh, now we'll move on to the next uh, item on the agenda. We'll have a bonding overview from both our nonpartisan staff, Chelsea Griffin and Mr. Andrew Lee. Uh, Ms. Griffin, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, again, my name is Chelsea Griffin. I work for the House Research Department, and I'm here with my colleague, Mr. Andy Lee. Uh, we've been asked to give an overview of the capital investment um, in state bonding this morning, or this afternoon, excuse me. Uh, I, before I dive into the presentation, however, I do want to call your attention to the information brief that's in your packet. It's titled Capital Investment in State Bonding. It's a house research publication. And that goes into more detail on the topics that we're going to be reviewing today in the presentation. So feel free to keep that as a resource. It's also available on House Research's website. Before I dive into the substantive material of the presentation, I'm going to give an overview of the role of nonpartisan staff to the committee. So even though Mr. Lee and I work uh, for different departments, I'm with House Research, he's with House Fiscal, there is a lot of overlap in the services that we provide the committee. But first, legislative analysts with House Research and fiscal analysts with House Fiscal serve all members and all committees of the House. We all provide confidential and neutral services. So if you come to talk to me about an issue, I won't share that you and I discussed uh, the issue with anyone without your explicit consent. And then by neutral, I mean that we provide information services. So we can provide you with uh, facts and data, uh, stuff that um, isn't political strategy. That's not our role. Our, our role is to give you the information you need in order to make decisions. And then uh, we provide subject matter expertise. So we are, uh, our goal is to be walking encyclopedias on our topics that we're assigned to. So you can feel free to come to us with questions uh, that pertain to this committee and, and we'd be happy to help you. And then our interim work is somewhat similar. We both work on publications during interim and we may be asked to serve on interim committees. Our roles do vary slightly. So uh, on the House Research side, one of the services that I can provide members is bill drafting and amendment drafting. So uh, for example, if there is a project in your district that uh, is seeking state general obligation funding, you could come to me and I could work with you and uh, the appropriate advocates to get that project into bill form. I also perform topical research, so I'll be approached by members to do deeper dives on topics or uh, gather information that they need to address an issue in their district. And I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Lee to talk about the unique aspects of House Fiscal. So uh, before Mr. Lee go, members, if you do have any questions, feel free to just uh, let us know and we can ask questions on the, on the go. Go ahead, Andrew. So uh, Mr. Chair and members, uh, so my role uh, uh, is to support the committee in terms of um, helping members with uh, physical matters. Um, so if you have a bill that you're unsure of the cost, um, I can help you request a fiscal note um, and explain fiscal impacts um, to budget areas. For capital investment, um, largely the uh, fiscal impacts are pretty straightforward. You'll have a bill that says X much for such and such project. Usually it's not that complicated for capital investment. Back to Chelsea. Mm -hmm. So uh, bonding generally, this slide uh, covers the process at a very high level. Uh, it starts with the government entity issuing bonds. Um, we define a municipal bond as a debt security that's issued by some sort of government entity, be it the state, a city, a county, um, other governmental entities. The bonds are sold to investors, and those investors receive payments with interest, and that interest may be tax exempt. And then the proceeds of uh, the bonds go to fund things such as capital projects. And I'll go into more detail about what we think of as a capital project. Bonds can be categorized in a variety of ways. I, on this slide, I put the five uh, categories that I think that you'll encounter the most as you serve on this committee. The first would be issuers. So what government issued the bonds? Was it the state, municipality, a special district, for example? 
And the second is what was the purpose for issuing the bonds? Is it funding transportation, buildings, sewer, or other infrastructure? Then thirdly, the source of payment. Is it general obligation or revenue? The tax status of the bonds is another way to categorize tax exempt versus taxable. And then term, uh, long or short term. There are three primary sources of authority for state general obligation bonding. The first is the state constitution. In particular, Article 11 of the state constitution covers uh, general obligation bonding and authorizes the uses of such bonds. The second uh, the thing that we look to is the Minnesota statutes, in particular, Chapter 16A. Uh, that's an important chapter for state general obligation bond, uh, bonding. The Section 16A.695, in particular, covers the use of state uh, general obligation bond proceeds. And then federal law has interactions with bonding. Uh, it, uh, it's what determines whether the bonds are uh, tax exempt or taxable. The uh, phrase full faith, credit, and taxing powers is something that you'll find in the bonding realm. And uh, I uh, copied the constitutional language here on the slide so you can see where it comes from. Uh, it's in Article 11, Section 4, and it's highlighted on the, on the slide. What that phrase means is that the state is putting its full weight behind the bonds. And interestingly, in, a, in another section in Article 11, uh, it discusses how if the state for some reason can't pay uh, the, or can't make the payments on the bonds, the Constitution actually requires that the state auditor levy a statewide property tax to pay those bonds. Uh, to date, this has not occurred, but I, I think it's interesting, um, an interesting tidbit for you to, to know in the constitutional language. Regarding the use of bond proceeds, uh, Bond proceeds must meet certain criteria, so I'm going to cover four for you on this slide. Uh, first, the bond proceeds must be used for a public purpose. Public purpose is a, uh, is a pretty broad phrase. Um, there's a public purpose if the expenditure can reasonably be expected to achieve a legitimate public goal or benefit. Second, uh, the use of the bond proceeds must be authorized in the state constitution. So Article 11 enumerates the uses for which state general obligation bond proceeds may be used. If the use is not listed in the constitution, it is not bondable. The use of the bond proceeds must be specified in law. So this is why when we work on a bonding bill, the writers have a lot of specificity. Uh, we need to define how much, for whom, uh, or to whom, for what, and the for what is defining the phases of the project that are, are, that are being funded, the location of the project, um, for example. All of those details are really important. And then finally, the Constitution requires that state general obligation bonds mature in no more than 20 years. Ms. Griffin, can you just explain what is a rider for our newer members who may not be aware of what it is? Certainly, Mr. Chair. Uh, so a rider is a description in a bonding bill. It's, um, for example, a subdivision in, uh, in an article of a bonding bill that describes uh, the project. So um, we'll often see a rider with the city name, the uh, project that's being described as the, as the head note, and then the rider itself uh, describes the project and what the appropriation of bond proceeds is paying for. All right, um, so I'll, I'll move on to the next slide. So bonding bills originate in the House, and this is because of, uh, or the bonding bills are considered a bill that raises revenue, and uh, therefore Article 4, Section 18 of the Constitution applies. It requires that all bills for raising revenue originate in the House of Representatives. Bonds to acquire and better public land and buildings. Oh, Ms. Griffin, uh, Representative Erdahl has a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Ms. Griffin. Um, yeah, bonded bills must originate in the House. Uh, what about if it's a cash bonding bill? Ms. Griffin. Uh, that's, a, that's a great question, uh, Representative Erdahl. Oh, sorry, Mr. Chair and <laughs> Representative Erdahl. Um, I, I guess I'm not quite sure. I'll turn to, to Mr. Lee, who's been doing this a little longer. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, if uh, the legislation only has an appropriation, so cash, uh, general fund spending, or um, other appropriations from other funds that aren't 
general obligation borrowing, I don't think that the uh, constitutional requirement would say it would have to start in the House. Representative Erdahl. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. So, uh, Mr. Lee, you're saying that uh, general obligation bonds, bonding have to originate in the House, but other provisions used for bonding projects do not. Mr. Lee. Mr. Chair and Representative Earl, uh, correct. If it's just a general fund appropriation for a capital project, the Senate could originate the bill. Thank you, Representative Earl. Thanks. Please proceed. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so moving on to the bonds to acquire and better public land and buildings slide. Uh, this is the primary purpose for which general obligation bonds are sold. And it's the first purpose that's listed in section five of article 11 of the constitution. I'll highlight the language here uh, that's on the slide. And when we talk about acquire and better public land and buildings, what we're talking about here is the capital project. So when you think of a capital project, you need to think of a fixed asset, so a building, not equipment like a computer, but a, a physical um, immovable building, for example. And uh, then the asset needs to be long-lived. And uh, based on bond council opinions, uh, the bond council has stated that long-lived needs to be at least 10 years. I also want to highlight another interesting aspect of this provision in the Constitution, and this is the three-fifths vote requirement for capital project bonding. So you'll hear this referred to as the supermajority vote, uh, and this requirement requires that at least three-fifths of the members of each house of the legislature um, vote for the, for the bill in order for it to uh, pass. Um, and in the House, that that equates to at least 81 votes. I mentioned previously that there are other uh, examples or other uses of general obligation bonds. Um, I have listed three here. There are, there are many others. But these are the three that I think you will encounter the most or may encounter over the biennium. The first is trunk highways. Uh, the, uh, there's a clause in Section 5 of Article 11 that states that state general obligation bonds may be used to establish and maintain highways, but these bonds are subject to the constitutional limits of Article 14 in the Constitution as well. Uh, the Minnesota Management and Budget, they have a great memo on the use of trunk highway bond proceeds, which I'd encourage you to take a look at if you're interested in this topic. Forestation is another use of state general obligation bond proceeds, uh, so you can bond for trees. And this provision was added to the Constitution in 1924. And then uh, finally, I wanted to call your attention to railroads. Uh, railroads are, are bondable. And this provision in the Constitution is particularly interesting because you can use state general obligation bonds uh, to improve and rehabilitate both public and private railroad rights of way. So that's an interesting exception to um, the public ownership requirement that we have with uh, capital projects, for example. Representative Scrabble. Mr. Chair, um, when you uh, uh, spoke about trunk highways, um, does transportation also have bonding ability, or do they have to authorize work on a thing and then it gets paid through us, or does it, do they pay through it through bonding there? Mr. Lee. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative, uh, so the uh, Department of Transportation also has to have the legislature authorize either um, a general fund of, or uh, sorry, trunk highway appropriation or authorize trunk highway bonding. Uh, in the past, trunk highway bond authorizations have been in both the Capital Investment Committee and or the Transportation Committee um, bill areas. So to answer your question, uh, for uh, the Department of Transportation to use bond proceeds, the legislature has to authorize it. And Representative Scrabble. Yes. Do they run it through this committee then? Representative Scrabble, so that's a discussion that I have had with uh, the speaker and uh, Chair Horstein, and the goal for us is to have trunk highway bonds go through the Transportation Committee. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <coughs> Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Bond Council, uh, you'll hear, or I've already used the phrase Bond Council in this presentation, but what you need to know about Bond Council is that there are specialized public finance lawyers that, uh, that work with local units of government and the state to uh, issue and sell bonds. Uh, the Bond Council issues opinions, and so this is where we get a lot of the guidance on uh, what's bondable, 
uh, they work through thorny issues that may come up in bonding. And uh, uh, for the state, uh, Kutak Rock is the law firm that's retained as bond counsel presently. Just a few other topics to cover before I hand the presentation over to Mr. Lee. Uh, Ms. Griffin, we have a oh. uh, question from Representative Carroll. Thank you. Just had a clarification. So the state retains Kutak Rock, Ms. Griffin. Uh, local jurisdiction. Uh, Ms. Griffin. Mr. Chair and Representative Carroll, yes, it's the, uh, the, the state retains so Kutak Rock as their uh, bond counsel. Representative Carroll. Chair, may I follow up? So, uh, so I've been uh, familiar with at the local level with bond counsel, and, and Plymouth uses uh, Briggs and Morgan generally. So the local level has its bond counsel as well as the state, it sounds like. Ms. Griffin. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Carroll, uh, yes. And in fact, one of the, the next slide that I have, um, the one after this one, it actually covers the differences between state and local general obligation bonding. But yes, um, local units of government retain counsel as well. Thank you. Please proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so the first bullet point on here is the use of state bond financed property. And what you need to know here is that there are restrictions on the use of state bond financed property. And those restrictions apply even if only a portion of a project is funded with state general obligation bonds. Those restrictions aren't permanent. Uh, they do disappear after a time period that's equal to 125% of the useful life of the project or until the property is sold as provided in law. And there are uh, specific criteria that needs to be met for that sale to go through and um, any sale, the uh, staff at Minnesota Management and Budget uh, would be involved. Then uh, reimbursement, um, you should know that generally bond proceeds are not used to reimburse for work that's already paid for. And this relates to uh, the uh, federal tax law and regulations on the use of tax exempt uh, bond proceeds to reimburse costs. Then the non-state match requirement. Uh, you'll hear this uh, referred to as the local match and it comes from section 16A.86 subdivision four uh, so since 1999, grants to political subdivisions uh, are required, or not required, but there's this presumption of it, them funding at least half a capital project with non-state funds. This provision is really interesting because it goes on to be very clear that the legislature may choose to fund projects that don't meet that threshold. But you should know that that the presumption is there in law. Um, and a local match is something that we discuss often when we're putting bonding bills together. Then uh, state versus local general obligation bonding. So there are differences. Oh, okay. go ahead. Mr. Chair. Representative Scrabba. Thank you. Um, Ms. Griffin, um, does, the, do we set precedent when we, is there, is there, um, Mr. Chair, maybe, is there precedent when we set, or is each case upon itself, it's, itself. Representative uh, Scrabba, so there have been uh, cases where the legislature, like Ms. Griffin has said, have fund, funded projects more than the 50% uh, the share, or you know, there are certain times that you know, we may fund less than 50%, and so I think that's for us to decide as a committee as we uh, move forward and consider projects. Uh, Mr. Chair, the, uh, I'm chairman of St. Louis County Planning Commission, used to be and uh, board of uh, adjustment and we were always tasked with different issues and everyone would always bring well you did it for them you have to do it for us it's like no each case is upon itself and if we look at it that way then, then I that's how I look at it I look at each one is different even though we have guidelines that we operate by um, sometimes those guidelines are too re re restrictive and, and and if we're allowed to go outside of those guidelines without you know, having the full force of the legislature or the committee can do it, then I, I feel it's more open. You know, we have, we have room to move it. Is that the intent of the presumption? So, you know, uh, Representative Scrabba, you know, what we have in law is the presumption that you know, there will be a local share of 50%. And, I, you know, like I mentioned, I think that's a discussion that we ha can have as a committee as we move forward with projects that are going to come before us. You know, in my time serving as uh, a member of the committee and as chair, uh, going back to the, the writer language, there are proposals that members are bringing forth saying that there's a non-state match requirement. And so I think that's something for us to consider as we move forward. And 
And so, you know, for, for all of you to really work with your local units of government to make sure that uh, we have the most accurate information. If they, they can't, then, you know, we can have that discussion as we move along the process. But I think the presumption is that there will be a local share so that the local units of government uh, will have something to contribute to the project. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Griffin. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so state versus local general obligation bonding, there are differences between these types of bonding. Uh, and so I've listed four differences here. The referendum requirement. The state does not need to go to the voters to issue and sell state general obligation bonds. But that may be the case for local governments, uh, depending on what they're funding. There is not a limit on net debt for state general obligation bonds. There are guidelines, which I think that Mr. Lee is going to touch on briefly. And I expect that Minnesota Management and Budget, when they um, come before the committee, will probably talk about that as well. Uh, but there uh, may be a limit on net debt for a local unit of government. Uh, section 475.53 is an important section uh, to be aware of on the local side. Then uh, public ownership. So this is a requirement uh, in the, the vast majority of cases with the exception of railroads, like I talked about with state general obligation bonds, but it's not necessarily a requirement for local general obligation bonds. There are instances where uh, the local geo bonds can be used to fund privately owned um, uh, projects. And then finally, the uh, sources of law where the bonding authority is derived are different for state and, and local entities. So the state geo bonding authority is in the Minnesota Constitution. The local bonding authority uh, is in the Minnesota statutes. In particular, uh, Chapter 475, that's where the bulk of the provisions are. Some are scattered uh, throughout other chapters of the statutes, but uh, the, these, are, these are the primary differences. I will say, you know, local bonding, um, bonding in general is really complicated, but if you're interested in diving into the local side of things a little more, the local government associations have some really great resources on this topic. So the League of Minnesota Cities, the Minnesota Association of Townships, and the Minnesota Association of Counties all have publications in brief or at length on uh, this topic. And now I will uh, transfer it over to Mr. Lee. Please proceed, Mr. Lee. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, um, I will go through an example of um, a spreadsheet from um, the last uh, large omnibus uh, bonding bill, the 2020 um, uh, bonding bill that was uh, enacted in October of 2020. Uh, so in your packet, you should have a uh, letter uh, size list that looks like this. It's labeled um, 2020 capital budget Fifth Special Session, Chapter 3. Uh, just to give you a bearing of, of what you're looking at here, uh, this is a listing by agency of all of the capital appropriations in that um, bonding bill. Um, you'll see at the beginning the University of Minnesota and then projects to the University of Minnesota. Um, so that starts on line six through line nine. Um, you'll notice um, that there's a column for fund. That's the type of um, either geo bond authorization, so that's general obligation bond, and see, uh, marked as geo, and then um, the amount that's appropriated. Uh, you'll also see Minnesota State uh, starting on line 12. And you'll notice the difference here where there's a geo appropriation for the higher education asset preservation program. But then after that, where um, there are appropriations for specific campuses, you'll see the fund type is GEO slash UF. UF stands for user financing, and that's where the uh, Minnesota State, um, both the system and the campus, uses part of their revenue streams to pay for uh, a portion of this, pro of this authorization. Um, in the past, it has been typically two-thirds are paid for by the state, and one third is paid for by the system and by the campuses. Um, Mr. So, Lee, uh, Representative Pulaski, you have a question. <clears throat> I've got a concern when we're doing this. Can you explain the um, tie to tuition increases that these bonding projects would entail? Mr. Lee? Mr. Chair, Representative Pulaski, uh, <clears throat> the, um, where the, the sources of uh, funding come from for the uh, system and campus uh, could be uh, tuition increases uh, tuition revenues, other fees. Um, so uh, tuition is potentially a source of that one third. Mr. Chair, that's not really the question I ask. When a campus or a system receives uh, a bonding project like this, 
does tuition go up or down to support those projects? And can you explain how it does? Mr. Lee. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, I think I would have to defer to um, Minnesota State in terms of how they choose to uh, finance these projects. I, I can't say for certain if it is guaranteed that tuition goes up if a project is funded. Um, I, I don't know that. I think I would, I would have to defer to Minnesota State. So, Representative Pawlowski, we are going to uh, bring in Minnesota State and the University of Minnesota for a day just to focus on higher ed, too. Mr. Chair, I want to bring it up now as an overview because when this was put into effect that there would be a tie to tuition, the thought was that the systems would ratchet back their requests because tuition would be going up. And just the opposite happened because they were taking tuition dollars to subsidize buildings, so the requests actually increased. This is something that I had hoped we could address this legislative session because the cost of tuition has gone up so much in the last 10 years that we have a major problem with it. So um, I agree, I don't need a full explanation of it here, but over the course of these hearings, I wanna make sure that we, we have an analysis here of why we did it, the result we wanted, the result we did not get, and maybe it's time to undo it. Thank you, Representative Pulowski. So we will uh, make sure that Ms. Nash reach out to the two system to uh, ask the questions that you have and for them to provide that uh, answer or those materials you requested when they come by. Representative Franson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, so I have a question here. Uh, so I'm glad you brought this up because I was looking through and I'm like, oh, my project's in here. Uh, so this would be the city of Alexandria for the Runestone Community Center expansion. And lo and behold, we passed this language in that 2020 October bonding bill. And now I find out that if the city of Alexandria wants to continue with this project, they have to in include rooftop solar panels. So could you tell me how that came about? Because uh, it was never in the bill. Ms. Griffin or Mr. Lee? Uh, Mr. Chair and members, um, in statute, and I believe Ms. Griffin might be able to say it better than I could, um, there are um, there's statutory requirements that the legislature has put in applying to projects funded by GEO bonds um, in, I think, 16A. Um, I, I'll defer to Ms. Griffin. Okay. Ms. Yeah. Griffin. Uh, yeah, section 16A uh, point... Well, 16A.695 is the section that uh, discusses the use of bond proceeds. I, I'm not familiar with the, this with that particular project, um, so I, I don't think I can weigh in exactly why or what the circumstances were that led to that, but we could uh, continue that conversation offline if you'd like. Representative Franson. Yeah, thank you, because we're all trying to figure out where it came from and why and how many other projects this is going to affect across the state. <laughs> Representative Erdahl. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, so, is it is it correct that uh, regarding Representative Franzen's issue that the uh, the stipulation uh, could have come from a different committee, not necessarily through this committee? Ms. Griffin, uh, Mr. Chair, and Representative Erdahl, uh, you know, I, I I'm not sure if I have enough information to really. To, to really weigh in. So um, Rep Representative Hansen has some information to share. Representative Hansen. I think it was this committee, because I think we asked about, you know, we were making stops over the last four years and asking about solar, and um, but I think it's even older than that. I think it may go back to Representative Hausman. So, you know, when when local entities are and the state are, or the universities are making their plan and their design and pre-design, they should take into account the law. So I, I think I could talk a little bit to that point. I, you, know, may, you may be referring to the state sustainability guidelines that we have for projects. Uh, I don't have the exact details, but I think it's the chapter of law that Ms. Griffin have a reference for us, and that's for bonding uh, projects going forward. Okay, 
If we don't have any questions, Ms. Griffin, if you could look at that information, the uh, state sustainability guidelines and make sure to send it to Ms. Nash and we'll make sure to disseminate to all members of the committee. Uh, Please proceed. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, uh, so uh, one other note I'd make on the two higher education systems is that um, uh, the University of Minnesota um, also issues about one third of the cost of its non uh, higher education asset preservation projects um, with their own um, debt. Uh, so just a, a note of that. Um, so the, the line seven through nine, you're seeing two thirds of the cost of the project and then the other third is financed through the, the University of Minnesota's own debt um, products. Uh, moving down to the Department of Education, um, and here you'll see a program on line 25 um, that is a grant program to local units of government, the library construction grants. And there's a number of these. I'll just highlight a few of them. I won't go through every line. Um, but I also want to draw your attention to line 27, where you see a um, named grant to a specific political subdivision. Um, so in other lines, you'll see basically a, a grant for, um, or an appropriation for state agencies, um, or a uh, program that the state agency administers. And here's the first example where you see a specific named project where the legislature names um, this amount of money for this specific unit of government for this project. Uh, then going to the next page, uh, you'll see the Department of Natural Resources online, or on page two. Um, you'll see some recurring uh, programs. Um, I'll just mention a few, asset preservation on line um, 43, uh, flood hazard mitigation on 47, um, dam safety repair um, on line 52. And here you can see an example of um, where a specific dam was called out on line 54 um, of 18 million for the Lake Bronson Dam and then a undesignated program amount um, on line 53. You'll see some more uh, programmatic um, uh, appropriations on line 57 through uh, 59, uh, state trails, and then the uh, grants to political subdivisions uh, that start on line 65. Um, and you can see the, the subdivision and what it is in the amount. So I won't spend too much more time on um, each individual agency. Um, just draw your attention to um, a few that stand out on page five, uh, the Department of Transportation. Um, you'll see um, two pretty large um, programmatic appropriations on line 156 for the local road improvement program. Um, and then you can see under that, uh, starting on line 161, all of the named grants um, for local road projects. And then the local bridge program on um, 177 and uh, the name project um, on 179. And a few more programmatic items and then um, uh, kind of other, other um, uh, grants to political subdivisions at the bottom of that page. Um, and again, I won't cover every single appropriation or agency. Mr. Lee, can you uh, help us understand the difference between these local roads and then those that are covered under the trunk highway bonds? Uh, certainly, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, so if a road is uh, owned by a local unit of government, a county, a city, or a township, GEO various purpose bonds, that's usually what you see marked as GEO or GOTF. Um, the TF is, stands for Transportation Fund, which for all purposes uh, in this committee is GEO debt and is a distinction without a difference, so think of it as just GEO bonds. Um, but if, uh, a, if road is owned by a local unit of government, uh, it is eligible for GEO bonds. If it is owned by the state, so a US interstate highway, a US highway, or a state trunk highway, then it is eligible for um, trunk highway bonds, uh, as Ms. Uh, Griffin talked about before. What gets complicated is that the two sources cannot be used for the, uh, the other. Um, and where it gets very complicated is when you're talking about an interchange project. Um, and so um, MMB and Bond Council and the project sponsors have to decide what components of what project of the project are benefiting to the trunk highway system, what components are benefiting to the local system, 
Um, and so you'll see splits between trunk highway uh, bond authorizations and geo uh, authorizations for interchange projects pretty often. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Please proceed. Um, and going down so you can see the Met Council on page six uh, with uh, programmatic um, grants starting on uh, 213 to 215 and then grants to local units of government starting on 217 and um, most of the grants to political subdivisions under the Metropolitan Council are um, revolve around either wastewater or sorry um, uh, parks for the most part. <coughs> And then you can see on the next page, Human Services, Veterans Affairs, Corrections. <clears throat> and then on page eight, um, the uh, Department of Employment and Economic Development. Um, and you can see this is an area where there's a lot of uh, grants to political subdivisions for various things. <clears throat> and then on the next page, page nine, uh, you can see the Public Facilities Authority. Um, there is a geo program that matches uh, state funds for um, uh, uh, water projects on line 315. And then the water infrastructure grant program for both clean water and drinking water that you can see on lines 316 through 318. Uh, point source implementation grants on 319, um, mostly re relating to wastewater. Um, and then again, you can see all the named grants to political subdivisions uh, below that. Um, then moving on, on page 10, you can see the Housing Finance Authority. On line 356 is the GEO bonding program for public housing, so that's publicly owned housing. Um, then the Historical Society, and then Minnesota Management and Budget. And the amount on line 367 is the bond sale expenses that is calculated as a portion of the total GEO authorization. That's essentially what MMB needs to sell the debt. Um, then, depending on the bonding bill, sometimes that's the end of the bonding bill. Um, uh, sometimes there's other articles included in the bonding bill. Um, in the case of 2012, there's a number of other articles after the GO appropriations. Um, so you can see there was a trunk highway bonding uh, article. Um, and then on the next page, you can see that there were uh, various general fund uh, appropriations. Um, and these were for projects that uh, would not have met the um, or potentially not have met the uh, general, obliga general obligation bonding requirements, uh, so they were perhaps not publicly owned or they were equipment or something else. Um, then you can see an appropriations bond article. Um, appropriation bonds are also state debt, um, but unlike general obligation bonds, they don't have the full faith and credit um, pledge, um, so they can also be used for things that would not be uh, geo bond eligible. Um, so you can see a number of four items were authorized in um, 2020, the largest of which was housing infrastructure bonds, which is a program at the Minnesota um, uh, Housing Finance Agency that is grants to nonprofit housing providers. Representative West. Really quick question on, I know appropriation bonds are generally higher interest rates, is that correct? Is there a consistent, are they generally like 20% more, is there some some metric you can give us to let so us know the different costs? <clears throat> Mr. Chair and Representative West, um, yes, they are typically higher. Um, I would have to get back to you on exactly how much. A lot depends on market conditions. Um, bond buyers will see the full faith and credit pledge as a higher guarantee than appropriation bonds because the state or the legislature could stop an appropriation to pay debt service. Um, now that's probably unlikely. Um, but it hasn't happened. Um, so, um, but I, I'll get back to you on the differences between uh, interest rates. Again, I would say a lot varies on market conditions at the time of the sale. Please proceed. Um, and then Mr. Chair and members, you'll see on the last page, the totals by fund. Um, so, uh, the grand total um, capital authorization in uh, this bill was 1.878 billion. You can see that on line uh, 438. And then there were a few cancellations of previously authorized bonding. 
So that gives you the net geo impact. Um, and then cancellations and trunk highway bonding, and then uh, some more technical numbers for uh, bill assembly. Um, but usually the big number that, um, that most people look at is line 438 or 444. Uh, so, <clears throat> moving on to debt service, um, uh, if in your packets you should have a legal size uh, landscape um, spreadsheet that looks like this. Uh, so if that's the list of projects, this is the, um, the payment for uh, debt that the legislature has authorized previously. Uh, so all of the um, debt that the uh, geo debt that the uh, legislature has off authorized previously, um, the payment for that can be seen on line five of this spreadsheet. So you can see it's about 1.14 billion a biennium. Um, and then below that, are the uh, debt appropriations for other types of debt. Um, so the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency, that's um, various authorizations going back to 2008. Um, you can see that um, that ramps up from, in the current biennium, 46 million um, in debt payments um, in 22-23 to 77.8 million in the 26-27 biennium. Um, then, in the past, there have been various uh, appropriation bond authorizations. So this is just a list of them uh, for the University of Minnesota, uh, biomedical facilities, the stadium. Um, the state appropriation refunding bonds are a, um, uh, something that occurred out of the 2011 session where the legislature had a, about a $5 billion deficit about one billion of that was um, reduced by um, reductions in spending, and then about three point or um, three point five was from uh, shifts in school aid formula, and then the remaining roughly um, half a billion dollars um, was uh, met by um, selling a, a debt product of revenue bonds from tobacco payments that the state was receiving from the tobacco settlement, um, and then. Um, reselling that as an appropriation bond debt. So essentially there was a one-time deficit in 2011 and the state borrowed off of a future revenue stream to meet that, that hole. Um, and so this is the payment as a result of that. Um, and then you can see um, on line 16, the um, Viking Stadium. Um, this is inclusive of other aids and payments to Minneapolis and St. Paul. Um, and then, um, on line 17, the Lewis and Clark Water Project. Um, on line 18, the Luth Regional Exchange District. Um, and then um, other appropriation bonds authorized in 2020. <clears throat> and then there were a number of one-time um, non-bonding appropriations that you can see on line 26 through 28. Um, and then just for um, members' interest, on the right-hand side of this table, I show the um, uh, when the authorizations were made and the total principal outstanding. Um, so you can see how much geo various purposes left. I also just showed a line for Trunk Highway. Um, so you can see 4.1 uh, billion is the geo various purpose that's currently outstanding and authorized but not yet, yet issued is 856 million. Um, and so you can see at the bottom the total tax supported debt that is currently outstanding um, at the bottom of this chart is just under uh, $8 billion. So if there's any members or questions on, on the debt service sheet. Representative Hanson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I was trying to think of this like a, a personal debt um, and with these various ages of debt and what they're locked into in terms of that rate. Um, and as interest rates have gone up, so, um, like what on the on the University of Minnesota stadium bonds from 2006, are those what they're locked in at that 2006 rate? Chris Ali. Mr. Chair and members, I, um, I will double check and get back to the committee on this, but I believe that the um, biomedical um, sciences appropriation bonds were refinanced. Most bonds, though not all, have a 10-year call feature. So if um, the market environment is, um, 
is, would support that, um, MMB, or in this case, the University of Minnesota, would refinance that debt. And uh, savings would then either accrue to the state or they would do another project with that same, um, uh, same amount of debt service. Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And on the uh, other tax supported debts, so the Ag Health Building, the DHS Building, um, my understanding is those are like we make payments on the debt and then eventually those will be state owned properties. And when they become state owned properties, they go off the tax roll for the local government. Is that correct? Mr. Lee. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Hansen, I will double check on the tax roll question. But yes, you're correct, it is like a lease, lease to own um, uh, situation with those. So um, the, these go back to 2002 when the state entered into a lease purchase agreement with the St. Paul Port Authority. The Port Authority put out the debt, um, built the buildings, and the state is paying the Port Authority to eventually own the buildings. Um, but the MMB tracks this as a state debt, so. Representative Hansen. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So if we paid that debt off, um, which is a little different debt, but it's state buildings, um, that could have a local government impact if they're currently paying property taxes now as a private building that's being rented out with that money being used to pay for ownership. Is that correct? Mr. Lee. Mr. Chairman, Representative Hanson, yes, although I, I will double check, but I, I don't know if, if if they are on the tax rolls. I, I don't know if the St. Paul Port Authority has to pay property tax on them, but I'll, I'll double check. And Representative Hanson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So if they are not, now there would be no impact if we paid that off. Mr. Lee. Um, Mr. Chairman, Representative Hanson, yes, on, on the property taxes. I don't believe so. I will double check, though, again. Please proceed. All right. Um, uh, then, <clears throat> Mr. Chair and members, the last item in your packet is um, the debt capacity forecast from Minnesota Management and Budget. Um, it's a um, handout that looks like this with the MMB logo on the cover page. Uh, so as Ms. Griffin mentioned earlier, there isn't a constitutional or statutory limit on state debt. Um, however, the Minnesota Management and Budget has a policy um, that they establish um, to, um, to limit state debt and as a um, mechanism to present to um, bond buyers um, how, they, how they, the state is managing um, its debt. So this, I should stress, is not statutory, it's not in the Constitution, it is a policy of Minnesota Management and Budget. Um, and um, if you go to page three, a little more than halfway down the page, there are three state debt management guidelines, and I'll read them to you. Uh, the first is that total tax-supported principal outstanding, so that's that uh, number that I mentioned on the debt service sheet, about $8 billion, um, principal outstanding uh, is, um, so the limit is 3.25% or less of total state personal income. Total state in personal income, the denominator in this guideline, is a number that MMB gets from um, uh, its um, macroeconomic advisor as an estimate of all um, in personal income in the state um, as sort of a size of the state's economy and ability to pay back debt. Um, and then um, the that eight, um, roughly $8 billion number is applied as the numerator um, to get to a percentage of the total state um, or debt to state personal income. And I'll, I'll show you what this looks like uh, later in this, um, in this report. Uh, then the next guideline is that the total amount of principal, both is issued and authorized but unissued, so that's the column that you can see in the debt service sheet of authorized but unissued, um, for state general obligations, moral obligations, capital leases, and real estate capital leases are not to exceed 6% of state personal income. So like the first guideline, the um, state uh, personal income estimate is the denominator, and then the debt that's either outstanding or authorized but not yet sold, and a few other things, is the, the numerator. Um, then the third guideline applies to the structure of state bonds. 
So 40% of general obligation debt is due within five years, 70% within 10 years, if consistent with the useful life of financed assets and or market conditions. So what this means is that the debt payment when the state issues bonds is front loaded to pay off more of the bonds at the beginning um, rather than have, it, have the debt payment spread out over many years. Um, then on the next page, uh, you'll see the calculation for guideline one and two on page four. Uh, so you can see that uh, just under um, $8 billion tax supported principal amount, and then the estimate for state personal income at uh, $395 billion. And so the percentage is of uh, the total principal outstanding is 2.02% um, of state personal income. And so that means the excess, the, the remaining capacity would be $4.86 billion. But there's an asterisk here, and the important thing to note is that this is a point in time, so this does not factor in the bonds that are authorized but will be sold. Uh, the bonds that are currently in, um, uh, that the state currently has outstanding but will be retired. Um, and to get a sense of what the capacity is factoring those um, items in, if you go to the page six, Um, you'll see uh, the table that shows um, uh, first the bonding bill assumed in November 2020 forecast, and so it's assumed to be um, 880 in um, this year, 880 in the next year, 135 in uh, 2025, and so on. And then the maximum new debt that would bring the state to that 3.25% limit would be 3.5 billion in. Um, fiscal 23, so this upcoming year, 2.255 um, billion in the next year, and then so on. Um, I should stress that this is not advice from MMB to the legislature of what to authorize, that's just the calculation of the maximum amount. Um, one other thing to note is that this doesn't take into um, effect the um, guideline three, which is that uh, piece of about structuring and front-loading bonds. Um, there's uh, um, potentially further restrictions in that. So um, last, last table that I'll show you um, is on page seven. Um, this is just a more detailed breakdown. So my, my, um, the um, debt service sheet had that, um, the, the summary table on the right-hand side. This is the more detailed breakdown of all of those. Um, so you can see each individual authorization for the MHFA bonds. Um, and then um, the detailed breakdown of the uh, moral obligations. Um, and the, the calculation again at the bottom there. Um, and uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Members, do we have any questions for Mr. Lee on the debt capacity report? Representative Scraba. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Lee, um, just for my curiosity, uh, Minnesota Housing Finance Agency, Housing Infrastructure 2021, uh, 60, million four hundred five thousand correct um, and then the unissued are those still unissued mr. Lee mr. chair of the scrub yes that's correct as of the November 2020 forecast those are still unissued um, I would have to double check with uh, MHFA I imagine they have those dollars programmed they don't typically issue the debt until they need the um, the, to spend the money. One of the reasons for the lag time and why you see such large amounts of authorized but unissued is because if the state were to sell the debt before they had a need for it, they would basically be sitting on money that would be depreciating in value that the state is not allowed to reinvest. Um, so that's why uh, MMB and other authorizers, including MHFA, wait until they need to get the dollars. So, uh, th Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Lee. That satiated my curiosity. Thank Representative Erdahl. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Mr. Lee. So, just to clarify for folks here today, uh, what is the suggested limit that the state could bond for this year? Mr. Lee. 
Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Erdahl, um, MMB um, estimates that the maximum new uh, debt authorization within the guidelines would be $3.5 billion. However, I, I don't think they would say that it is a suggestion. They just say that there's the maximum amount. Um, so how much is, is up to the legislature? Is it 2.5? Representative Erdahl. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Would you repeat that? Uh, Mr. Chair and members, the maximum new debt uh, within guidelines would be $3.5 billion. But again, I wouldn't say that MMB is saying that's a suggestion. That's, that's just what the math would show for the maximum. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Lee. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I was listening with my conservative ear and heard 2.5. <laughs> All right, members, uh, seeing, uh, do we have any other questions for Professor Palowski? Mr. Chair, this question is probably directed at you. What we heard today was mainly on general obligation bonds, and yet it's highly likely we're going to do a cash bonding bill sooner than we do a general obligation bonding bill. So what's the criteria for a cash infrastructure bill as opposed to a general obligation bill? And when I looked at the House Research document on page 2, I see a public purpose statement. On page 4, I see a reference to the general fund but they're sort of vague and nebulous, and we're going to have a sizable, it would seem, cash infrastructure bill. So Mr. Chair, are we developing the criteria for what's going in, and if so, when? So that is uh, a good question for us, and you know, this being our first uh, committee hearing, if members have any suggestions on, you know, for any criteria that we should have for any general fund, a request for capital investment, do let us know. And I think that's something that we could work together towards uh, putting a bill together, whether that's geo, cash, or all of the above. Mr. Chair, I think the sooner we get on that, the better it will be. So we know that this isn't an all and everything bill, that there will be criteria and that we won't be putting things in that we'll regret after it's been passed. That's a, that's a good point, uh, Representative Pulaski, and I, I think that at the very basis, we you know we want to make sure that whatever we have in our bill will be infrastructure related, and so that we do not have anything that's you know extraneous that may not be uh, infrastructure related or to the work that we are doing within our community committee. Representative Erdahl. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, I guess going along with uh, Representative Pulaski's uh, comments, uh, just want a, uh, another clarification. Uh, he seemed to indicate that uh, uh, there may be just a cash bill before a bonding bill, or w what is your thinking as to how we proceed along those lines? Uh, thank you for the question, Representative Erdahl. You know, for me, I would really like to see us get joint targets with the Senate and uh, the administration so that we could, you know, start really putting a bill together, whether that's uh, two separate bills, geo, cash, or one bill that has both, uh, that's still up in the air. And as uh, in terms of going forward, we're going to be pushing our leadership to make sure that uh, we could get direction as soon as possible so that I could work with you and your caucus and our uh, caucus and the entire committee to uh, put the bill together. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. If I could continue. Uh, a question that uh, came up today to me. Uh, you know, I, I've been thinking that we'd be looking at the, the framework of the bill that we almost got to the finish line last year. Uh, and, uh, and I think in our conversations, it's, we've kind of discussed doing that. Uh, I mean, we have a bill that, uh, for those that weren't here, we almost got there. Uh, I'm suggesting that the framework, uh, that's what we work off of. And, uh, you know, maybe, uh, I don't know, you have cash or geo bonding that discussion that we'll be having, how much of which. But the question is, uh, are members going to need to uh, refile uh, a bill requests for this, or are we going to be, we're not going to be having hearings on the same projects that we just put into another bill? What should members be doing in terms of uh, bringing their bills forward? That's a good question. Thank you, Representative Erdahl. So I would encourage members you know, of the committee and members of the House to uh, get your bills jacketed and filed. And for those that have been heard in previous session, if there's no substantial change, then we uh, do not uh, require them to come before us uh, for consideration and in inclusion for a bonding bill. But if 
there are significant changes, you know, for example, that we have heard from MMB around inflation around a 20%, then I think it'll be good for us to have that in front of us so that we could give it its due consideration as we move forward in the session. Thank you. Members, any additional questions? Uh, Seeing so, you no know, uh, additional questions, I do want to uh, thank you all and once again welcome everyone, especially our first term members for joining us in this committee. I'm really excited to have all of you. And thank you to uh, Mr. Lee and Ms. Griffin. And I do see that Representative uh, Hussein has joined us. Our next meeting will be on Monday, January 9th to get an update from MMB on the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, the uh, American Rescue Plan Capital Projects Fund, and also the Capital Projects Cancellation Report. Uh, having no further business before us, this meeting is adjourned.